Welcome back. We're going to continue with our exploration of the art of ancient Rome. This time we're looking at the imperial period. In, in 44 BCE, uh, of course, the Roman consul, the Roman ruler, Julius Caesar, is, is murdered. And this leads to civil war. Uh, after this civil war, though, and shows support for Caesar, he is declared a god by the Senate. In 31 BCE, Octavian, his grandnephew, uh, defeats very famously Mark Antony and Cleopatra, who in 27 BCE, the Senate confirms title of Augustus uh, for Octavian. And he is considered to be the princeps, or the first among equals. He is also the head of the Roman religion, um, known as the Pontifex uh, Maximus. Uh, really, Augustus, because of this, becomes the first emperor of Rome, even though the Senate is still there and the Senate is still making laws. And emperors from this point on are, um, uh, the line of secession means that they are chosen uh, uh, by the previous emperors. So Augustus, as the first emperor, formerly known as Octavian, but now Augustus, uh, is known for this incredible uh, you know, decades of peace uh, that come after his rule due to his strong military might. And then also for our purposes, Augustus is important because of the huge um, building commissions that occurred under him. You know, he was said to, you know, he found Rome a city of brick and he left it a city of marble. Augustus, as kind of a display of his power and for the wealth of the empire and for, you know, just the success of the empire, uh, wants to demonstrate this through these massive public building projects. This is the very famous Augustus of Prima, Por uh, Prima Porta. This was made for his villa and his wife's villa at the town of Prima Porta. Uh, you can see immediately, and I've included the image on the right, the Ale Metale, the image from, of the orator from the uh, Etruscan period. You should automatically be able to pick up this connection between the orator and Augustus. Certainly, um, as we talked about, there is a huge Greek influence in Roman art, but that Etruscan influence will never fully go away. The Ale Metale is an image of um, sort of a man addressing his equals, this is very much an image of an emperor, uh, and it's meant to display Augustus's imperial power. In fact, the emperors of Rome claimed that they were divine. They traced their family line through the goddess Venus. So her son Cupid, uh, and sort of represents the idea of kind of a royal and divine bloodline is shown here at the bottom holding on to sort of the hem of Augustus's cape. Now, if we look closely at his uh, cuirass, his armor, we can see that there uh, is sort of a political message here referring to his divine power. This, uh, on the surface, refers to a, a victory over the Parthians in 20 BCE, but if you look above, we have all of these different um, Roman divine figures and, and the Parthian king surrendering. And then we have these other gods and goddesses sort of surrounding the figure here. Now, this is, at this point, uh, an ancient technique, isn't it? We could trace this all the way back to the Stele of Naram Sin. Uh, once again, it's one thing to say we kicked your butt because we wanted to, and another thing to say we kicked your butt militarily because the gods demanded that we kick your butt. In the imperial period, what we see is more or less a rejection of the verism, that truthfulness we see in the Roman um, Republican period. And so, remember in the Roman Republican period, statues were truthful, well, from the neck up, basically. They still looked like Greek uh, athletes <laughs> from the neck down, but there was this neat desire to portray them as youthful and strong. And we certainly see that with Augustus, who will always be pictured um, really more like an Egyptian pharaoh or a Greek 
God as eternally useful or etern and eternally powerful, not as a the middle-aged man he would have been when this statue was made. Uh, this is a monument, a very famous and a very important monument called the Arapacus or the Ark of Peace that was designed to represent this Pax Romani, this peace of Rome, and, and one of uh, Augustus's uh, main accomplishments during his, his rule. But this was also made in, as, as a birthday present for uh, Livia, and when it was, de and it was sort of debuted on her birthday. Now, what is the Archipiece? It was located in the sacred district of Rome called the Plains of Mars. It is a, uh, basically a, a small building, a uh, shrine really, with an altar inside and uh, relief sculpture along the outside. If, if we sort of look at a cutaway and if we look at a plan of the Ark of Peace, um, you can see it's rather simple in its structure. It has an entrance and an exit. It has a sort of a raised platform in the center with a shrine uh, where offerings could be made. Now, on the outside of the Ark of Peace are lots of images referring to not only peace, but also prosperity, and the way that Augustus can um, provide for the people of Rome. And uh, one of those strategies is to show sort of gods that represent um, this concept of bounty, this concept of fertility, this concept of being able to provide, of largesse. Uh, and so we see this in the form of this goddess, and there's, there's debates on who this goddess is. Uh, some say she's Pox or Peace or Tellus, which is Earth or Venus. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, leave that to the experts to debate, but what's, what's important is is what she represents here. And that and this is this sort of idea of fertility and bounty. Here she is with two children um, who either directly reference um, the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, or they refer to, sort of allude to Romulus and Remus. And then on either side we are given images of the winds, which represent the sort of the, the large uh, um, size of the Roman Empire, really literally from east to west. And then underneath we have images of, well, we have images of grain and we have images of livestock. Once again, this kind of, these kinds of visual strategies have been used since ancient Sumer, guys, right? So uh, this, is, this is nothing new. Augustus's peace, his Pax Romani, his peace of Rome, has brought brought to Roman citizens. Another image on the, is an image to show Augustus's uh, reverence and to show his religiosity uh, because he is the head of the Roman faith, right? He is the Pontifex Maximus. He is the head of the Roman faith. And so one way of showing this is to show the Roman hero Aeneas. And there was a poem written around this time by the Roman poet Virgil called the Aeneid. And the Aeneid tells the story of the Roman hero uh, uh, Aeneas, uh, and he was a hero during the Trojan War. And after the Trojan War, he leaves and goes to found Rome. And so the Aeneid is this long epic poem based on telling the story of Aeneas. And it was also thoroughly propaganda um, meant to uh, sort of justify the imperial rule of Augustus. But here we have Aeneas uh, who is offering a sacrifice to one of the Roman household gods. The Romans had lots of gods like the Greeks did and they, you know, this was a culture of ancestor worship and they had these basically household gods, these ancestral gods that were sort of you know, gods of, of specific families, right? And uh, uh, here we have Aeneas being faithful, being a, a good servant of his gods, being a, a religious man, a man of religion and faith, uh, doing what he is supposed to do, showing that he is moral, showing that he is ethical, and showing that he follows these sort of divine rules by making the sacrifice to these 
sort of household gods. So we have already two images here that are basically telling us what a badass uh, that uh, Augustus is. In one image, he is he he is equated with bounty and peace and prosperity and fertility, and in the other image he's shown for his religiosity and his faith. On one side, on the north wall, uh, we have the procession of the Senate. Uh, so this relates to, of course, the importance of the Senate in uh, Roman culture. You know, that even though uh, um, Augustus is the emperor, he is still the first among equals. He is not better than anybody else. He's just kind of in front of everybody else. On the other side, on the south wall, we have a procession of the imperial family. And uh, we can see also the inclusion of children in this. Now, this is important because in, you know, the Romans got a lot from Greek art. And in these two friezes especially, um, the, the references to the Greek Parthenon are very explicit here. This is very similar to the Panathenaic frieze of the Parthenon with images of sort of the people or representations of the people and the rulers of Rome. Uh, but the Greeks rarely showed images of children, but for the Romans, who sort of celebrated the individual and the common man, um, we also see that extended to children. Now, these are imperial children, but they're children nonetheless. There's also scholars who argue that this was um, also referring to a problem that was growing within the empire and within Rome itself, and that is a, a fertility problem. Um, there is an argument that the inclusion of children here is also meant to sort of inspire people to keep making those babies and keep making those next generations of Romans. Inside the Arapacus, uh, surrounding the altar, we see uh, images of, of, um, of wreaths. We see images of fruit, uh, refer referencing, once again, growth and fertility. And then we also see images of bull skulls. Oh my god! <laughs> so here we are in ancient Rome, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, way past uh, ancient Sumer, uh, tens of thousand years way past the, the caves of, of Lascaux, and yet we still see this imagery that we've seen since literally the beginning of art. Um, no bull, <laughs> but bulls. This is a, 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 a building from France that um, is thought to have been built in, in that style. Uh, this is called the Maison Carré. It is a small temple in Nîmes, France. Uh, and it is, um, you know, not that different than the uh, Fortuna Portonis uh, that we saw earlier. It is a, a small Roman temple that draws sort of equally from both Greek peripteral temples and also um, Etruscan temples. It is kind of a faux peripteral temple with engaged uh, columns uh, along the sides uh, with Corinthian uh, columns uh, this time around. But, you know, very, very sort of typical. Um, I want to talk now, though, about a, a Roman architect, a guy named Vitruvius, who wrote a book called De Architectura, or On Architecture. And um, Vitruvius is uh, not only an architect, but he's kind of a theoretician. Um, he had ideas beyond just architecture, but he had ideas about uh, city planning. He had ideas about aesthetics. And, you know, he believed that buildings should, first of all, be form over function, that they shouldn't have a lot of uh, unnecessary decoration. Um, in fact, he hated the third style of painting. Remember, it was very decorative. Uh, he felt that it didn't really serve any real purpose. He's also a guy who believes in, um, uh, like the Greeks, that uh, in perfect proportions, uh, and that architecture should sort of represent um, sort of mathematical ideals. And his, his thoughts influenced a ton 
of architects, uh, not only throughout the Roman period, but uh, on the Italian Renaissance. Okay, so let's now look at the world-famous Colosseum, other, uh, otherwise known as the Flavian, Flavian Amphitheater. That's hard to say. Fl say that ten times real fast. Flavian Amphitheater. Flavian, anyway. So the Colosseum kind of reflects the end of one dynasty and the beginning of the other. The Julio-Claudian dynasty, the dynasty sort of started in the memory of Julius Caesar and carried out through his heir uh, Augustus, um, dominated the early years of the Roman Empire, but that sort of ended with the Emperor Nero, who was a tyrannical, corrupt emperor uh, who ultimately committed suicide. And so a new family, a new dynasty took over called the Flavians. Uh, and uh, the first Flavian ruler is a guy named Vespasian. And he becomes emperor after this incredibly bloody battle. They were a military uh, family. So what is, uh, what, what the, the Flavians do is to build a structure called the Colosseum. The Colosseum is placed on the site of Nero, the former emperor, uh, on his old palace, uh, and uh, also a, a play, uh, where he had a giant colossal statue of himself. And this is where the word the Colosseum gets its name, is because it not only is it large unto itself, but replaced the colossal statue of the emperor Nero, although its official name is the Flavian Amphitheater. When the Colosseum first opened, there was something like a hundred days of games. Um, this was because the Flavians were very much using this as a sort of a symbol uh, for the people uh, of Rome, as almost kind of like a peace offering as this, after the corrupt, uh, horrific era of the rule of Nero. This was kind of a way of sort of saying, all right, our bad, <laughs> uh, we're going to put you guys first. And so they build this massive um, Colosseum. The, the image we have today is rather different than it would look like back in the day. Uh, we have a building that has basically been picked apart over time today. Um, you know, half of the upper structure of the building has been removed, all the seats have been removed, and the floor of the arena has been removed. Where'd they go? Well, they went to go build um, new buildings and a lot of churches, basically, because when um, Rome became Christianized, a lot of the early Christian rulers uh, wanted to, you know, tear apart uh, what came before as a way of sort of saying, hey, we're in power now, and we're sort of the new guys in control, and uh, also uh, it's cheaper to take materials from another building than it is to mine those materials <laughs> yourselves. But this meant that the Colosseum has been basically a skeleton of itself now for a very, very long time. But in its heyday, this was a massive structure. It could seat 50,000 people. Uh, like the amphitheater, though, in Pompeii, it has a velarium, this uh, fabric uh, sort of covering that could shield uh, spectators from the sun. But otherwise, uh, we're looking at a massive structure. It's about 160 feet tall, and it's about that same distance across, too. It is made up of three um, arcades. An arcade is a row of arches, with a fourth story being called an attic at the top. The arcade in, uh, on the second and third floor cont uh, uh, contained um, statues, whereas the third floor was uh, used... Uh, for entering the Colosseum. The arcades are divided into three distinct styles. Uh, this is basically like a sort of a tribute to uh, the history of Greek architecture here. At the bottom we have um, what's known as Tuscan, which is basically the Roman version of Doric columns. On the second floor we have Ionic columns, and at the top, you guessed it, we have Corinthian, uh, with the attic layer being uh, more solid with only these pilasters. Um, making any sort of decoration, and this was all made out of a material, a local stone called travertine. Although the structure of the building, um, a lot of it would have been, what do you think it would have been made of? You guessed it, concrete. So here we have the two biggies in Roman uh, civic engineering. We have arches, 
and we have uh, concrete. If we look into the interior of the building, we can see that those arches and barrel vaults, which are basically just stretched out long arches, uh, comprise a lot of the supporting structure of the Colosseum. So also notice that, you know, there would have been seats sitting on top of here, and of course, those are all gone. But when this building was in its prime, there was nothing like it on Earth. And what did people go, what kinds of things did they go to see in the Colosseum? Well, sporting events mostly, and, and mostly um, battles uh, involving gladiators, gladiatorial sport, oftentimes blood sport. But certainly the interior of the Colosseum is incredibly complex, because on the top of well, on the, the floor of, of the arena is called, well, the arena, and it was made of wood, usually covered with a layer of sand. In fact, the, the word for um, sand in um, Latin is arena. But as you see in this image, there were animals. And uh, not only was there human-on-human -human combat, but there were also hunts and one-on-one um, um, -on -one battles between human beings, between gladiators, and various animals. And these animals and the gladiators were kept down underneath the arena floor. Uh, so we are look, you are looking at one of the great engineering marvels of, of the ancient world. Another significant change we see in this period is a return to Verus. Remember one of the things that happened when Augustus became emperor was that all of a sudden, the, the sculpture, the statuary, became very idealized, but everybody became youthful and strong and, and badass and godlike. Uh, but Vespasian, who was not really into the sort of the whole pomp and, pomp and circumstance of being an emperor, this was a career military dude, and he was much more down to earth. And uh, following that kind of tradition comes this much more um, kind of getting back to their roots with this veracity, this verism, this truthfulness uh, in Roman art. And we can see that in the depiction of Vespasian here with his wrinkles around his eyes and on his forehead, his, his bald head, although there's nothing wrong with that. But we can see, you know, there's, there's a lot of truthfulness here to his appearance. And this, this was, you know, it can be seen sort of in depictions of, of normal citizens, of emperors, of whatever during this period. We see sort of a return to truthfulness. Uh, let's look at another major kind of uh, large-scale Roman civic art, and these are called triumphal arches. Triumphal arches are uh, arches that were made to commemorate a special event. This could be a military victory, but it could also be just a person. It could be uh, a non-military event. And so the son of Vespasian was an emperor named Titus. And uh, Titus is probably most well known for his sacking of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, this is what is depicted on his triumphal arch. This was actually built after his death. This was built by uh, his brother Domitian. So on the, the script here, basically says that, that uh, Titus is a god because the emperors believed that they were. Uh, if we look inside the arch and we look straight up, we can see Titus sculpted on the ceiling in relief, uh, riding on the back of an eagle. This is something called an apotheosis. An apotheosis is a concept that came from ancient Greece, and it is a kind of honorific uh, process of, of elevating a person to the level of the gods. In fact, the idea of an apotheosis is that when a great person dies, whether that person is a poet or a leader or whatever, they are carried on the wings of, in the Romans' case here, the wings of an eagle, and taken up to sit alongside the gods. Now we're going to be looking on the on both sides of the arch here, on the interior. You will see depictions of uh, Titus's victory. On one side we see these the spoils of Jerusalem. So Titus and his men sack the holy temple in Jerusalem and here we see them carrying uh, the spoils of war. And you can see uh, the menorah here being carried out of the temple. On the other side, we see another reference to Titus's 
godhood. We see him in a chariot. Riding alongside him is a Nike or a symbol of victory, once again from ancient Greece. And leading the horses is this personification. A personification is when you take an abstract concept like valor and you turn it into a person. But this is literally meant to sort of put Titus up here on sort of the levels of the gods. Okay, moving into the High Empire. So in 96 um, CE, Domitian is assassinated because evidently he lived a very, very extravagant lifestyle. And so we have a new line of emperors called the Nerva Antonine Dynasty. So Nerva becomes emperor, and he was chosen by the Senate. This is really where we start to establish the succession by adoption, and we move away from family lines, and we start getting into rulers who choose their successor. And then he chooses a guy named Trajan, and it goes on and on and on. We will talk about all of these guys as we, as we move through this period. Trajan is one of the great uh, emperors. He was the first non-Roman emperor. He came from Spain, although Spain was under Roman control. He is not ethnically Roman, culturally uh, Roman, but this also should be a clue in here of how sort of worldly Rome has become at this point, because now Rome is stretching its borders under these Nerva Antonine uh, emperors. Rome has become a much more international, cosmopolitan kind of place to the point where that the emperor doesn't even have to be from Rome. This is designed by Apollodorus of Damascus. It is called the Forum of Trajan. Forums are large sort of public uh, meeting areas uh, for civic meetings, but they are usually surrounded by other kinds of things, by temples, by um, monuments and even shopping areas. And that's what is going on here. This was a large uh, complex, more or less right in the middle of town, uh, that was meant to commemorate Trajan and his victories, but also provide a sort of public pay place uh, for people, uh, for the citizens of Rome. Um, the most famous structure from this area is a column of Trajan. The column of Trajan is uh, 128 feet tall. It is composed of a frieze, a, uh, um, a relief sculpture that tells a story. And if you unfurled that image, it would be 625 feet long of relief sculpture containing 150 episodes and 250 figures. So if you, if you imagine, in many ways, what this is, is sort of a large, massive version of a Roman standard. Soldiers marched carrying a standard that said SPQR, the Senate and people of Rome. And after a Roman victory, they would plant that standard in the ground, and then they would pile the shields and the weapons of their enemy around it as a sign of their victory. So this is kind of what this is meant to be. This is the burial, um, this is basically a burial column of Trajan. In fact, when this was first constructed, um, shields and swords were placed around it because it's basically a giant military standard. It tells the story of the victory of Trajan over a group of people called the Dacians. The Dacians were a people north of the Danube River, basically Germany. They were a Germanic people. And this is a very complicated image because it, 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 it just doesn't tell the story of victory. It tells the story of the construction of the weapons and the, the uh, you know, the ships and everything else used in the battle, just in the same way Roman sculptors are interested in capturing every single line in somebody's face just perfectly. If a Roman art, if Roman artists are going to tell the story of a battle, they're going to give you every single little aspect of that battle. <laughs> you know, if you look at the quality of the craftsmanship, it's quite high. This is a rather low relief sculpture, but um, we see um, this rather realistic depiction of the soldiers and the events of this battle. You know, this is a very tall structure, and most of these images, you could not see them really at all. There are some surrounding structures here. There are some libraries around here. Uh, there's also Basilica over here. We'll talk more about what that is a little later. So you could, you know, maybe stand in some of these windows and see some of the some of the relief sculpture, but it would still be very difficult. It's almost more like this is there not just to be seen. 
and not just to tell a story, but it's there to show the power of Trajan. You have to be pretty darn powerful to be able to construct something this detailed and made with this sort of level of artistry. And so in itself, it's just supposed to be impressive. There are these little slots in here which were made to hold banners. Uh, and here in this image, you can actually see soldiers carrying the standard in the battle. You can see it's rather quite detailed. You can see uh, the, e even the sort of the, um, the, the military techniques of the soldiers as they're fighting. It's, it's rather quite detailed. And here we see uh, this rather gruesome image of Roman soldiers carrying the heads of the Dacian enemies. I mean, there's thousands of these figures, and yet we have folds in their clothes. You can see the, look at the, the guy's calf muscle here. It's, it's, of course, this is all rooted in, in Greek stuff. Um, but the, the craftsmanship here is really quite high. You know, the, the, the classical era is, is 600 years in the past at this point. That's, that's like us looking back towards the Renaissance, isn't it? So there had been, you know, 600 years of artistic development and refinement since the ancient Greeks sort of came up with this humanistic, realistic way of depicting the human body. And so by the time we get to this high imperial period, we are seeing a, 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 a refinement. We're seeing sort of the best quality of this kind of art. The Emperor Hadrian is another important Roman emperor. He was very much a student of Greek culture, and one way you can tell is his beard. This was meant to be modeled after uh, images of Greek philosophers. Hadrian's most famous structure is a building called the Pantheon. Pantheon literally means all gods. It is a temple constructed by Hadrian uh, to serve as a, as a sort of multifaceted temple. When you first approach it, it looks very much like a traditional Greek peripteral temple. You know, it, it's sort of typical Greek features. We have Corinthian columns here, but it's actually a two-part building. It is constructed of a more or less square porch area, and then a rotunda, which is a round building in the back. As one approaches the building, the first thing you would see is the inscription, which reads, Marcus Agrippa made this. Um, this was the site of an older temple that burned down, and it was rebuilt by Hadrian. Since the Romans were very much into ancestor worship and paying honor to the patricians of the family, emperors were no different, and it was very important to them to pay tribute to those who came before. Marcus Agrippa was a Roman ruler who built the original temple. And so being a good Roman who honors his ancestors, he said that it was built by Marcus Agrippa. When she would initially walk through the porch, originally greeting you would have been three large statues. Some say it was three emperors, some say that it was the three main uh, Roman gods. So upon your initial approach, this looks like a typical Greek temple. But as you get inside and you get into the rotunda proper, you realize, oh, this is a much different building. And sitting over the rotunda is a dome. The Romans had to sort of push their engineering skills to the limit because this structure is something like 150 feet across. It was the largest dome in the world when it was built. So how did the Roman engineers build this? Well, let's, let's approach this idea of the dome. What is a dome? A dome is basically an arch that is spun 360 degrees, but it operates on the same principle as an arch, that the pressure is sublimated outwards and downwards uh, along the length of the dome. You'll notice though that the engineers have done some things to make this an even more viable structure. So first of all, you'll notice that it's thicker at the bottom of the dome, but it tapers and gets thinner at the top. There's less pressure because there's less weight because it's thinner. The builders put these indentions. These indentions are called coffers, and this also helps reduce mass, thus helping to reduce weight. Also, you can imagine they used a lot of concrete. In fact, they had to formulate a new kind of concrete to construct this, and then they would embed large stones into the concrete uh, that would act as sort of like a, a, a tooth kind of to a grip, right, to hold the concrete together. They didn't have rebar. They didn't have iron bar inside like we do in our modern concrete construction. So basically pebbles and stones sort of acted as, in, in a similar manner as iron rods would today. And then you'll notice at the top of the ceiling is a hole 
This is known as the oculus or the eye. What is the weakest part of a dome? The weakest part is going to be right in the middle. And so the Roman engineers decided if you actually get rid of and make a hollow spot in the top of the dome, you have greatly reduced that downwards pressure. Uh, uh, this ring around the dome is basically acting as the keystone, and it's pushing that weight out, which is then being sublimated down the length of the dome. And so we have this magnificent structure, which is unlike anything else on Earth, literally anything else on Earth at the time. If you think about it, this entire building in many ways is a special effect to put one in a state of awe. Leading into the original building would have been a long courtyard, which is no longer there. And then you would have your porch, and then you have your rotunda. So you're in a, as a viewer, as a spectator, as a person coming into this temple, you're basically uh, removing yourself further and further and further from the ordinary world as you kind of journey and transition into this divine world. And uh, uh, each one of these stages is sort of meant to represent a separation as you go from this outside world into this divine world of the gods. And this is also represented in the symbolism of the geometry of this building. So Vitruvius, remember that dude? Vitruvius had this concept of divine geometry, and he believed that certain shapes represented spiritual concepts. And for Vitruvius, and those who followed Vitruvius, like the builders of this building, believed that squares represented the earth and the four corners of the earth, and that spheres and circles represented, well, heavens. You know, if you think about this building, it is literally a square and a circle in its design. In fact, if you look closely, you'll notice that squares and circles are repeated everywhere in the floor. Although this is not the original floor, it was its model after the original floor. But there's squares and circles everywhere, representing where the, the, the earthly world and the divine world come together. And so, in a way, there's kind of a whole spiritual process as one goes from the normal, everyday, mortal world, transitioning through this courtyard, through the porch, and then into this rotunda. And what's incredible about this is there's no column, there's no supporting wall, there's nothing supporting the ceiling but itself. It would have seemed almost magical. And then, as you look up, um, you would actually see stars. Originally, there would have been stars painted in the coffers, as you can see here, representing sort of the divine world. And then this oculus represents a sort of gateway to the realm of the gods. So the oculus is serving two purposes. The oculus is serving an engineering purpose and helping relieve stress on the center of the dome, but it is also an opening into the world of the gods. Now, you might be asking yourself, yeah, but what if it rains? Well, the Romans thought about that too, and the floor is built at a slight angle, and water drains off. Uh, there's a, a collection of, of drains along the side. But structurally, this building has never really been added onto. It's never been remodeled. It is pretty much stands as it was originally created, with the exception of the front plaza, the, you know, Rome at this point was a massive city, over one million people living in Rome. And Rome suffered the same sort of problems as all large cities do, with overpopulation, with pollution. Um, most Romans lived in, uh, in what is called an insula, or a plural would be insuline. And these are buildings that were, you know, you know, two, three, four, or five stories tall, with multiple rooms. Typically, though, what differs from modern apartments is they usually had communal kitchens and bathrooms, you know, sort of surprisingly modern in their appearance and, you know, their their construction. Uh, they would have also been decorated. There were, it was not uncommon to find um, frescoes, to find mural paintings uh, on the ceilings and the walls uh, of these apartment buildings. But this is where most Romans would have lived. Uh, unless you were part of the ruling or imperial class, you typically lived in an apartment or an insula.
And speaking of common people, let's look at the art very briefly of common Romans. Well, this is a funerary relief of a, ve of a person who, of who was a vegetable vendor. It's rather crude. The proportions are off. You know, one arm is significantly bigger than the other. The body appears disjointed. Um, also, the body appears sort of almost crushed and small. Um, if we look at the image on the right, this is a, a guy who worked at the, Circus, at the Circus Maximus, which was another big sports arena. It was a racetrack uh, where there would be horse and chariot races. And he was a manager there, basically. Not a ruling class sort of dude. And if you look at the proportions on the figures here, and here's the guy right here, they're rather odd. They have these large heads. They have these sort of squat bodies. This is not the, the, the Greek humanist tradition, is it? Well, what is going on here is, well, this is the art of the common people, made by artists who weren't maybe as necessarily trained or skilled as those that were hired by the ruling classes. And so we get art that is not as refined, that has a different sort of aesthetic, that is not as worried about this sort of image of perfection uh, as the art of the ruling classes would have been. And I'm showing you this because this art, the art of the working class, the art of the poor and the middle classes, is, is going to slowly take over. The last image I want to show you is an image of an apotheosis. This is from the column of Antoninus Pius. And on one side, we see kind of a typical imperial Roman image. Uh, we see an apotheosis, and you guys know what that is. We see um, Antoninus, and we also see his wife carried on the back of a, a, a Greek genius, which were spirits of wisdom. You know, you can see the Greek tradition here. You can see the young, beautiful bodies. You can see the realism. Um, you know, you get an idea that uh, these are both pretty accurate portraits of the emperor and his wife, and it's all fairly typical. But on the other side of the column is something really interesting and different going on. We see a completely different aesthetic here. This is the funeral march of the, of the emperor. If you notice the proportions of these figures, with their large heads and sort of squat bodies, in fact, look at the proportions of the men compared to the horses. They're absolutely, and the horses are just sort of dwarfed by these massive figures. Everything seems off, doesn't it? Because by this time, the poor classes started to become slightly restless. And this was a, a way of sort of kind of appeasing and acknowledging the, the non-ruling classes by using this more common, less refined style of art. The artists are trying to sort of appeal to two audiences. On one side, the more traditional kind of imperial audience, and on the other side, the sort of less refined kind of working class audience. We are about to get into the beginning of the Christian era here in Rome. The Christianity, as we shall see, was largely spread among, initially, the poor and working classes of Rome. And so the art of early Christianity is going to look very different than traditional Roman and Greek art. It was not as refined as the more traditional Roman imperial art would have been. And we can see the beginnings of this and the fact that emperors are starting to make concessions towards the working classes by using art in an imperial context that is not traditional imperial style art. It's like the difference, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, I'm about to get nerdy, real nerdy here, it's like the difference between an elf and a hobbit. Now Marcus Aurelius was one of the great emperors, in, both in terms of the way he treated the Roman people and in terms of his military victory. He was also a philosopher. He wrote a very famous book on philosophy called Meditations, based in uh, the Greek concept of Stoic philosophy. Stoic philosophy, to sort of put it very simply, means living a life of sort of uh, of an even keel, right? It means uh, not succumbing to one's passions or emotions, but letting sort of logic rule uh, your actions. So it's they were sort of like the Vulcans from Star Trek before the Vulcans from Star Trek. Uh, there's this emphasized hard work, humility, learning, eliminating desire, uh, creating this sense of, of logic um, 
and eschewing emotion. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength, Marcus Aurelius says in his meditation. So on the image on the left, we see an equestrian statue. Uh, these were fairly common in ancient Rome, but this is the only one we have left because most of the other statues during the early Christian period were um, destroyed uh, because it was mistakenly thought to be another emperor an emperor that we'll study in a little bit called Constantine, who is the first Christian emperor. Uh, you can also see Marcus Aurelius is portrayed here wearing a beard in the Greek philosopher's style. But these equestrian portraits, portraits of, of rulers on horseback, um, were normally, you know, uh, Im images of power, images of bravery. But here in this late troubled period of the empire where we have an emperor who is more interested in philosophical arguments and ideas uh, we have kind of a thinking man's emperor um, we have a, a man who is showing worry on his face who is sort of showing an internal sort of struggle maybe it's a struggle between logic and feeling. I don't know exactly, but what, what we see here is something very different. We don't see the sort of surety and certainty that we normally associate with imperial portraits. Um, under Trajan and Hadrian, Romans began to favor burial over cremations. Their, their funerary practices began, began to change, and part of this was an influence from religious beliefs out of the East. Uh, religions like Christianity uh, that buried their dead as opposed to cremated their dead. These are found in Egypt, uh, which has a long history, as you guys know at this point, of burying the dead, of burying mummies. So um, what, we, what we see in, uh, in these uh, portraits from a place called Fayum in Egypt is uh, incredibly lifelike portraits of, of you know, various citizens of the late Roman Empire. Um, you'll notice on the left uh, a name, uh, Leia of Cyzicus. Uh, Leia was a, a portrait painter, a woman portrait painter. Uh, it's rare that we know the names of, of artists at this point in time. The name of the artist wasn't as important as the subject matter that they created in this period. However, um, not only do we know the name of an artist, we know the name of a woman artist, and that was in itself uh, rather rare. Um, if you look at the image uh, of the coffin, or the sarcophagus, you can see that the bottom looks rather Egyptian in that sort of traditional composite figure that you guys are used to. But the, Egypt at this point was under Roman rule. Um, we see sort of this coming together of two cultures, the sort of realism of the classical Greek and Roman culture and the more stylized and abstract imagery we associate with Egypt. These portraits were made on wooden panels. Uh, they were made using a material called encaustic. Encaustic is a paint based in, uh, on wax, particularly beeswax in the ancient world. And uh, you would take your pigments, and pigments could be made of all sorts of different materials. Pigments could be made of uh, crushed gemstones. They could be made of plant materials, even some materials derived from animals. And then they would, you would grind those up, and you would mix them with the wax. Then you would melt the wax. You add in your pigment, and then you paint on the wood, and the, the wax adheres to the, the wood. After the Antonine dynasty, we have the Severans, and these rulers weren't necessarily the best choices for rulers of Rome at this time. There are some historians who say that really the decline of the empire uh, kind of begins uh, here. But in both of these portraits, we are seeing doubt. We are seeing, uh, in the image of Caracalla, anger, uh, aggression. Uh, we are seeing, um, in many ways, sort of negative emotions that one wouldn't typically associate with rulership. This is something we would have never seen in the early empire. I mean, imagine uh, an image of Augustus, you know, who portrayed himself godlike and perfect, showing himself as the way Trajan Decius has with his his worry and his doubt, or in the way that Caracalla has, uh, looking almost like kind of a schoolyard bully. 
we can see these the tremendous changes and the rejection of sort of the rules of classicism in other works of art. This is uh, the Ludovici battle sarcophagus. We're looking at a battle, but what's fascinating about this image is the lack of negative space. You know, one of the th one of the sort of hallmarks of classical art is its use of order. Um, lots of negative space to separate the figures. Uh, it gives it a sense of logic, and that is gone here. Confusing times brings trying and often confusing and difficult art. Uh, this is very similar to the art of the lower classes. Um, this sort of chaotic arrangement of figures. Also, um, notice that the the bodies are starting to look not as squat as they were in some of the other works of art that we saw, but there is, uh, there are some weird proportions. Look at the rather large arm on this figure here. Um, one of the most significant changes in the late empire was the uh, invention of something called the Tetrarchy. And the Tetrarchy consisted of four rulers. There was a, a fear that the emperors couldn't handle this massive empire. So to make rule of the, the empire and the military rule of the empire easier, it was thought, let's just divide the empire into halves. And so the empire was divided into a western empire and an eastern empire. And then each side, the east and west, was ruled then by two emperors, an Augustus and a, and a Caesar of the east and an Augustus and a Caesar of the west. Diocletian was the Augustus of the Western Empire. We see an image here of the Tetrarchy. It's done in a purple stone called Periphery. Purple is a color associated with rule. Periphery is a purple stone, but it's very rare. Purple dyes were very difficult, uh, difficult to acquire, so purple clothing was very rare and expensive. So purple, because of its of its scarcity, because of its its expense, was associated with leadership and rulership. Now you'll notice immediately that the tetrarchs all share the same face, and if you look at the eyes of the tetrarchs, it's almost like all of a sudden we have gone back to the Greek archaic period. We have, it's almost like, you know, 600 years, 700 years of artistic development have, are starting to be lost. We have lost the individuality in the faces. We have lost the um, naturalism and realism of the faces. And once again, the figures are squat um, instead of the uh, sort of normal proportions that we see in the classical era. Um, so all of the all of these things that we associate with classicism, realism, individuality, um, this sort of quest for a kind of a perfect body and a perfect mind, all of that stuff is is gone. And these these four tetrarchs are in, uh, shown embracing each other as a as a as a as a way to show their sort of unity. Uh, but it really comes across, at least to me, more like they're clutching each other in fear uh, because the empire very much at this time was was threatened, threatened internally, politically, religiously, threatened by outside forces. And uh, there was this real fear of, of that the empire was beginning to decline. It's hard not to see uh, a sense of... of, of of panic in these in this image, these sort of hapless rulers clutch sort of weakly to their swords and clutch weakly to each other. Constantine is one of the most important Roman emperors. He is the emperor that is responsible for ushering in Christianity. But by the time we get to the fourth century, uh, Christianity is becoming a um, a very popular religion within the Roman Empire. Um, so Constantine was uh, a tetrarch, and he got into a skirmish with another person who claimed he had right to the throne, Maxentius. And at the very famous Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312, uh, Constantine's army defeated Maxentius's army. Constantine claimed that he had a dream and that his soldiers fought under the symbol of Christ. Now, I've seen this interpreted as a cross, but it's also just as likely, and in fact, I think more likely, that what he's referring to is this symbol down here on the left. This is sometimes known as the labarum, but uh, I, I, will, I will call it 
the key row. But these are Greek letters. These, in fact, these are the first two letters of Christ's name, and they were common symbols. And on his deathbed, Constantine converts to Christianity. Uh, Constantine's wife and his daughter were both Christian converts. Um, and so Constantine is seen as the first Christian emperor of Rome. This is his triumphal arch, an arch divided into three sub sections, just like the Holy Trinity. Let's take a look at the top frieze on one of, uh, one of the friezes at, uh, of this arch. And here we can see that new style, that uh, Christian style, uh, is really becoming coming into use here. The figures are squat, they are out of proportion, um, they are often generic. Um, I mean, all these guys basically have the same face. This is a very different set of artistic rules that are being followed here. Um, if we look at the image of... of, of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. We can't look at the face of Constantine because at some point in history it was chipped away. Um, but if we look at the other two emperors depicted here, um, we can see uh, something very similar is going on in terms of their kind of more generic faces. Um, what we see here is Constantine uh, being flanked by two previous and popular and very well thought of rulers. So he is doing that age old sort of thing that rulers like to do, associate themselves with rulers in the past. Uh, here is a closer look. So this is they called the distribu uh, distribution of the largesse. So this is Constantine basically handing out food and coins and stuff to the people to show that he is a ruler that can provide. This is also on the Arch of Constantine. And if you look at these two tondi, a tondi is a circular image. Tondi is the plural of tondo. And if we look at these tondi, you can see these are much more traditional. In fact, they're so traditional, these were actually taken from a, another monument built for Hadrian. Uh, so these weren't even designed for, originally for the Arch of Constantine, uh, but were sort of slapped on later. And if you compare the sort of elegant, um, sort of more normally proportioned uh, classical figures here with sort of the squat, hobbit-like figures of this new, later style, um, very much influenced by the middle and lower classes and by Christians, um, you can see that there is quite a difference. But that also means what? That also means that there's two audiences, right? There's this more traditional classical audience and there's this newer growing audience of the sort of working classes and the Christians that are being appeased here. The last sculpture I want to take a look at is this portrait of Constantine. This was from uh, his basilica called the Basilica Nova. Uh, just the head alone is uh, eight and a half feet tall, so this is massive. Uh, this would have been sitting on, the statue would have been sitting down on a massive throne. If you look at his face, you can see there are some aspects of his face that are very traditional, classical kinds of techniques, the cleft in his chin, his nose, uh, which look very individualized and specific to a person. Uh, but if you look to his eyes, they're that more generic, almost once again, sort of Greek, archaic, sort of bulging kind of look. Those almond-shaped eyes that we often see in ancient class, or archaic Greek art, as opposed to the more realistic eyes of uh, the Roman Republican or even in, in imperial periods. And that's it. That's it, guys, um, for this chapter. I'll see you in the next chapter. All right, bye.